Hey, welcome to our online service. My name is Eric and I'm so glad that you are joining us here today. Hey, if you could do me a favor and like, comment, and share this post, that way it gets into the hands of as many people as possible. I and the rest of our church would super appreciate that. Other than that, we're gonna pray and dive into what God has for us this morning. So will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity we get to come and hear your word. God, I ask that for this next hour, wherever we are, that you ready our hearts and you ready our minds to hear what you have for us. God, we love you and we thank you. It's in your son's holy name I pray. Amen.
a miracle can happen now for the spirit of the Lord is here the evidence is all around that the spirit of Today's epistle lesson comes from Paul's letter to the Romans, chapter 13, verses 8 through 10. Now hear the lesson. Owe no one anything except to love one another, for the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God for his holy word. We want to be glad in our creator and rejoice in our King Jesus. We want to praise God's name and to bring God our tithes and offerings. So let us pray together. Ever present God, just as Jesus promised to be among us, where two or three are gathered in his name, be among us now, that these offerings may be, become instruments of the love of Jesus and his salvation and justice. All for the glory of God, our Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.
Welcome to this sermon entitled, God's Called Out People. The text is from the 18th chapter of the Gospel of Matthew. And this text, Jesus speaks about how to handle uh, conflict within the church. And so, uh, these words. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, Let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth, about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God for his holy word. Jesus has a number of followers that have come around him. And it began with disciples that he called, the Twelve, and then it expanded to include uh, women and to include others outside of that. Jesus anticipates that the following of him will continue on, of course. And he calls um, those who will assemble together, he calls them the ecclesia in the Greek, or uh, the church. Now, the word ecclesia means literally to be called out. The church is God's called out community of faith. This word ecclesia only appears twice in the Gospels, all in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew 16, 18, and also here in the 18th chapter. The word ecclesia means that we are to understand that we are called out by God. It is God's idea to call us to be in covenant community together. We enter into the new covenant with Jesus. He becomes our Lord. We become his followers. And Jesus calls us out of a world that has an entire separate uh, system of values than the values of the kingdom of God. Jesus calls us out because life is at stake. Jesus is concerned about relationships, our relationship with God, 
our relationship with other followers of Christ, and our relationship with those who are not yet a part of the body of Christ. So Jesus knows that as we follow him, we will get together, we will assemble, we will worship, we will have teaching, we will pray, we will witness to those who are around us. But he has a caution for the church. He knows that conflict will happen in the church. And he's not merely talking about conflict at a mundane level, like, oh, I want to have this gathering, Oh, but someone else doesn't want to have that gathering. Or, I, I think we should spend money in this way. And someone else says, no, I think we should spend money in this way. It is much more serious than a disagreement about a project or a direction. Rather, what Jesus talks about is that sin will still happen among the followers of Christ. It says if another member of the church sins against you. In other words, someone has done something that breaks a commandment, that breaks the covenant in which we are a part of. Um, we would like to think that no one will treat anyone else in the church badly, but and that Christian people should be sugar and spice and everything nice, but it isn't so. Everyone is wounded. Everyone needs in the church the power of Jesus to sanctify our lives, to transform our lives. So, someone has sinned against you. Perhaps they slandered you, told a lie about you, misrepresented you, humiliated. Perhaps a person stole from you within the church. These kinds of things are real sin. How do we handle such conflict that is based in sin? Well, unfortunately, the most common way the church handles this today is that when someone is sinned against in the church, someone usually just leaves. They leave the church and they go find another church. Or they simply drop out of church altogether for a season and sometimes for a lifetime. Conflict may end but the scars occur and grace is thwarted by the very people who are called to extend grace to others. So Jesus wants us to handle conflict in ways that are consistent with who he is. And notice that in this passage, Jesus asks us to care for the one who sins against us. We are to love. Now, it begins like this. Go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. In other words... Protect the honor 
and reputation of the person who has sinned against you. So often, people want to repeat someone's sins to as many people as they can tell. But here, the aim of Jesus is to extend grace and regain the one who has acted wrongly. So if the member listens when you um, are with that person who sinned against you and repents, turns from it, all is well. But what if you're not listened to? What if the person doesn't see it as sin? What if the person thinks they're right to have said what they said or did what they did? Then the counsel is to take one or two others. Now, the implication is that you take wise people with you. People who are seasoned in faith. And it's, Jesus says it's so every word can be confirmed. That uh, the truth in is to be handled and listened to. And so the goal of having two or three others is to eliminate misunderstanding and embrace the truth. Now, if that doesn't work, it says you must tell it to the church. And keep in mind that at the beginning, most of the churches were house churches, small gatherings of assembly, sometimes 20 to 40 people at the most, but usually maybe even less than that. We tend to take this out of context and imagine parading someone before a couple of hundred people. And then uh, uh, airing their sins before that many. I don't think that's what's intended here. I think what Jesus is wanting to say to us is that we're to take it to the leadership. And so perhaps there's some group within a church that can handle such a thing as this. Now... When you take two or three members, and what if the person refuses to listen to it, and you tell it to the church, and then they refuse to listen to even that? Then Jesus says, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Now, at first that sounds like you're to treat them as a total outsider and throw them out of the church. But again, the whole tenor of this passage is that Jesus asks us to care for the one who sins against us with the whole idea of regaining that one into uh, intimate fellowship. So at first I was uh, taken aback by this, let the one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. And then I began to think, how did Jesus treat Gentiles and tax collectors? Keep in mind that the Gospel of Matthew is written by a tax collector. How about that? Very interesting, isn't it? Let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. So maybe they're acting as if they're outside the fellowship by persisting in sin. But far from shunning sinners, Jesus ate with sinners. In fact, Jesus had the reputation of being called a friend of tax collectors and sinners. He kept reaching out in love to bring 
people into covenant community. Jesus wants to extend grace to restore that which has been broken. In the world, people are ready to write others off quickly. The world wants to treat people as outsiders, cast them out, condemn them, and seek to define them by how they're different. But Jesus wants us to seek and to save the lost, even those within the church. And so, when someone separates themselves from the body by sin, they maybe are to be treated as someone who we want to regain back as if for the first time into the body. Jesus prays that we would all be one. Jesus wants to heal division. But something else is necessary for that to happen. Prayer is necessary for restoration. Now, Jesus says something here that is vastly misunderstood. He says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I tell you, if two or three agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I am there among them. Jesus is talking here about prayer. Now, it sounds like prayer is almost something that we decide what's needed. Then if we agree with it here on earth, it goes to heaven, and then God will do it for us. That's not the way it works. I know it sounds like it's the way it reads, but it's interesting. In the Greek, it would be better to translate this passage like this. Whatever you bind on earth has already been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will have been bound already in heaven. In other words, prayer is to discover God's will and bring God's will to earth. That's the connection. It isn't that we decide what God should do. It's rather... We should discover what God wants us to do. We are here in prayer to have two or three to get together so that the discernment process is more sure. We want God's wisdom. This prayer is aligned with the Lord's prayer. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We don't pray our will. We pray God's will. And in order for conflict to be healed within the church, we need to be praying God's will. If the church refuses to forgive and heal, who on earth is going to do it? We're to love our brothers and sisters in Christ, including those who sin. But prayer helps bring God's will to earth. We are God's called out people. We're not to live on a basis of competition or condemnation 
or punishment. We are to live into the world of love, repentance, to turn from what's wrong, to receive forgiveness, and to see God heal us and overcome division with unity. This is sorely needed today. And isn't it what we want to be about? I think we can do it. Because Jesus says we can. With his power, we can do this. Thanks be to God. Amen. As we leave this place, we go with these words from Colossians 3, verse 13. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. Go in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Have a great week, everybody.